the uh, the inaugural episode, the the maiden voyage. Is that is that sound a little too? Uh, uh, Am I building it nautical? up too much? <laughs> <laughs> we no, should I, want, I want this to be a very nautical show. We about should today. mention that we rented a yacht because <laughs> we thought that would make it a better podcast. We are coming to you from the high seas. My name is Paul Gilmartin, and this is the first episode of the Mental Illness Happy Hour. And uh, I am so pleased that my first guest uh, could uh, find time in her schedule to uh, to be my, uh, my guest. She's my co-host on Dinner and a Movie. You've seen her in a gazillion things on... Uh, on television. What's the name of the character on Entourage that you play? Oh, her name was Amy Miller. And she was uh, a she producer. Was in, yeah, she was like a network executive. Yes. Um, and uh, most recently, uh, Janet just booked a, uh, she is the voice of The Last of the Airbenders. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, old man, you're close. <laughs> Avatar. It's The Last uh, Airbender, uh, The Legend, the legend of, of Korra. Of Korra. Yeah. yeah. And, and you booked the voice of Korra and didn't even tell me that you had booked the lead to I it. You're just like, oh, I got this part in a, well, an animation thing. It, it, with animation, I don't know that it really matters. I mean, it's it's such an ensemble show. and, and oh, uh, this, is, this is so much to get to with you already. Already, already <laughs> minimizing your achievement. It's, not it's good. fantastic. Whatever you're thinking, it can't. I can't. It can't be good, and it I don't deserve because it. Because I'm associated and I don't deserve with it. it. Uh, the uh, the show that I, that, that I hope to uh, to offer to the nice people out there listening is a, a show about uh, people who live with depression. Uh, don't necessarily have to suffer from it. Um, actually, this could also be for people who are interested in it. Um, but I, I and not I, just depression, right? I mean, it could be anxiety, it could be absolutely any uh, any form of mental stress mm -hmm. uh, or, or or illness. You'll have psychopaths, sociopaths. Absolutely, I'm going to go into the killers. go into the prisons, good. And get some get raped, and do some really good shows. Good. Uh, my hope is uh, because I've, I, I, Janet, as you know, we've talked about this. And one of the reasons why you're my guest is we've both been very honest with each other over the years about uh, our struggles with uh, with depression. And um, I, there were times when I was so depressed that I felt so like nobody understands the way I feel. Yeah. And then when you and I started talking about it, I realized we feel the same way. And the more I've opened up to people about what it feels like to have that gray blanket of depression when, yeah. it, when it comes in like a fog mm -hmm. and robs you of energy and, and joy, um, it... So many people feel that same way, but there's not a way for them to connect. And I hope that this podcast and the website will be a community that people can connect to each other and say, hey, I'm taking this pill. It has this side effect or, you know, hey, I discovered this great thing to do when I'm exercising that, that it helps give me energy or a thought to think or a book to read or whatever. Sure. Um, but you uh, are one of those people who's been... Uh, so important in my life because you're you're so open with your feelings and talking about your pain and mm. childhood stuff and yeah. uh um if if i can uh, sound just a little bit uh, clinical uh oh please I, I would love to go through the different decades of your life mm, interesting. And, and if you could on a scale from one to ten one being suicidal ten being oh my gosh. completely wow. content yeah and and at peace, if you could give me a numerical value of roughly what your your ha the, your happiness state was, you know that I don't. Decades. I've not lived that many decades, so it might be short. To, You're in your early sixties, <laughs> right? <laughs> we maybe maybe you could. Well, maybe not, we might break it down even more, just because. Just well, because actually, when it's I not. Think it's, about, it's not decades. The yeah, way I have it, it broken would, it down would not is, really make sense. I have uh, before grade school, uh -huh. then grade school and middle school, then high school. Then 18 to 22 or college, 20s, 30s. Yeah, that makes sense. Does that work for you? It does. And I want to tell the nice people that I have not been prepared for this at all. So this That's is going to be totally, no, I mean, just yeah. in case anyone's wondering, I don't have anything prepared and Paul didn't warn me how he was going to conduct this. So uh, if uh, I make a fool of myself, um, we'll know, all bear witness to that. You know what? Uh, I, I didn't want to do a podcast for the longest time because I didn't want to make a fool of myself. You would think 20 years into show business, I would realize too late. You've made a fool of yourself. <laughs> but um, I think that's also one of the one of the hallmarks of depression is a, a perfectionism in yeah. there and just that feeling of being overwhelmed. I'm not going to be able to do this perfectly. Yeah. So uh, wouldn't we rather let people think we could have done better if we just didn't try very hard? Yes. 
Yeah. Oh, they'll always think I was more talented than I was if I don't apply myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I try my hardest, they'll find out I'm not right. that great. Right, right. I would rather fire myself than be, sure. be fired. Exactly. Uh, so um, from infancy to grade school, where would you, where would you rate your uh, um, happiness generally? Uh, well, that my, and, and I'm, if my dad loves, uh, dinner and a movie and loves you and loves mm. me and is an amazing person and, this and is my no, mom is amazing. Yeah. This is no, no reflection, reflection on, on my parents or my folks, but, but that stuff, you know, that, especially when you're a kid, you, yes. that stuff does come into play and, you know, um, it's <laughs> obviously they already know when they split up, but, mm -hmm. um, but my parents split when I was, you know, four or five ish. I don't have okay. really any memories of my parents together. I just have mm -hmm. a couple mm -hmm. and they're very, very faint and they sort mm -hmm. of don't make sense. I think, and, and they're, and they're not really about my Are parents. Are you sure you're not thinking of the movie, The Fugitive? I am. I was about to say I yeah, lost my arm yes. in, in an accident. Yes. You've got it. <laughs> and that I didn't kill my wife. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, that's why this is the happy hour. You're allowed to interrupt me and that's tease right. me. Um, and that's my other fear too, is that I will become too glib and right. somebody will really be trying to pour their heart forth <laughs> and uh, I'm going to shit on them. Yeah. So uh, bear with me as I find out what the, <laughs> what the tone of this show is going to be. That's fair. But, that's fair. So uh, your parents divorced when you were four or they, five? They separated when I was, yeah, when I was really little, when I was, I think in second grade so i would have been five five and six years old because i i um i skipped kindergarten um because you were smarty pants i was a smarty pants i sort of got my kindergarten education in preschool because i went to the this academic preschool you mailed away for your preschool uh, diploma didn't you, you did i did it, you did it by mail. i did yeah i was an amazing typist also <laughs> and i wore little a-line skirts and wore curlers in my hair um pennsylvania sixty-five thousand. uh but um yeah, so I don't really remember that much about them being together. I was a wreck when they split, for sure. And um, and I was just a holy terror. And I can't believe what so I you, put them so you through. Acted, you I was miserable. Yeah. yeah, so I yeah. don't know. I mean, I don't know if you can say you're suicidal when you're mm -hmm. four. And, and that's I wouldn't characterize myself as that. But I was... Um, I was unhappy a lot. I ran away all the mm -hmm. time. Like, mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, pack a knapsack and... Mm -hmm and and run away and 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 be gone for hours and then mm -hmm. eventually get hungry and have to come back home and mm -hmm. i said horrible things to my especially my mom um because i she had primary custody of me initially and mm -hmm. i used to um just scream and yell at her and say horrible stuff and I still feel terrible about that, you know, because as you're, you're going through a separation as a parent i'm sure the last thing you need is your child saying you know i hate you right. Um, so miserable, really. I mean, a, a, a fairly miserable youth. That's not to say I didn't love, you know, watching Sesame Street with my dad and I didn't have right. great trips with right, right, him right. and stuff like that. Okay. But well, let, let, let's, if we can just go through the decades okay, and okay. just assign it a cold clinical number. All right, this number, is hard. Okay. I like to overanalyze And them. nobody's, don't, we're not worrying about hurting anybody's feelings. Okay. okay? okay. This is not a reflection on other people because right. you could be raised by the happiest family in the world and yeah. be a miserable person. Yeah. I've met people like that. Yeah. So it's, yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, up, up until, uh, grade school, um, yeah, I'm, uh, up till four or five, what would you, what would you, um, or do you just don't remember? I, if that's a really early okay. on, then let's say, uh, from, uh, first grade to sixth grade. That's when I was most miserable. Okay. So give, give me a number. Um, f like a four. Okay. And then, um, middle school to high school? Uh, Not middle school to high school, I was pretty happy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to say like a, an eight. Okay. High school? High school, um, high school is like, I don't know. High school is like one day you're a two and the next mm -hmm. day you're a nine. Yeah. Um, I had, I, that's when I started experiencing my first real signs of mental yeah. illness. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's what this uh, should be is the range of numbers. Yeah. Yeah. From... I, yeah. Well, I'm, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not, I've never been diagnosed as bipolar and I don't mm -hmm. think of myself as bipolar, but yeah. I definitely think that when you're a, a very highly sensitive person, as many people have said before me, mm -hmm. you have these extreme, amazing euphoric highs. Yeah. Um, 
and you think the world is an amazing, perfect, beautiful place, and then the lows are as, as are low so, as the highs are. Are so crushing low, and then you think there's got to be a way for something external, some person, place, or thing that can, that can get me out of this. And right. so then you become obsessive about the things that bring you pleasure. Right. And I think a lot of times that's right. where, where addiction springs from is yeah. – People are just self-medicating because one they're depressed. One thing feels good. So Absolute. if you do that one uh, thing as much as you can, oh then God. somehow you'll feel okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've established uh, a, a swing in uh, in high school. Major of, swing in high school. Feelings from two to nine. Okay. Uh, 18 uh, to 22 or the college years. Uh, what um, would the swing be? The swing would be like from a two to a six. Six. Okay, so then you started feeling worse. Then in your in your the rest of your twenties, early tw well, sort of early to mid twenties, um, kind of living down in the threes, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then up upwards from my mid twenties, much better. Six, mm -hmm. sevens, mm -hmm. eights. Okay, and now that you're solidly into your fifties, you, <laughs> uh, your thirties. What would you you say you're just barely into your thirties, uh, and how are they so far? I think I'm. The best I've ever been. Okay. And I have a, I, one of the things that I like to say about that, which is, is advice that my mom gave me, which I actually said on someone else's podcast fairly recently. Um, I can't remember what the context was. It might've been Jimmy Dores. Mm -hmm. That's not very recent, actually. I think that did, I did that like a year ago, but, mm -hmm. um, but my mom, my mom is an incredibly smart, incredibly amazing woman. And, you know, she's sort of lived with her own challenges. And when I was in my very early twenties, um, I would call her, I still called her when I was mm -hmm. having a complete breakdown. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to call my dad because I didn't want to disappoint my dad mm -hmm. by being upset. Why do you think that is? Do you me. think you, do you think he is, um, he had more on his plate and it would, uh, you were worried about burdening him? No, um, it, know, it, it wasn't that my, and my dad was always so available to me. Both of my parents were so incredibly available to me and so supportive and so, understanding and so you, kind through think all that, of this but why do you think you um, protected I, your dad from because i don't like disappointing my dad because he he i felt like he never saw my flaws the way my mm. mom did and when i was younger i hated that my mom knew when i was up to something or knew mm. i was up to no good or didn't trust me so she had already I, been disappointed she had already been disappointed yes. and um and and i knew she was much more prone to her own moods and stuff like mm -hmm. that and even though i'm i'm much more like my dad and my personality in a lot of ways, um, my dad just always seemed so happy and he always seemed so proud of me. So you me. felt like he lived more in an idealized world that yeah. you didn't want to upset. I never want, I only wanted to give him the good news. Do you still feel that way with your dad? Um, n a little bit less so, but yeah. I, I think that I still, there's still a difference mm -hmm. between what I, what I am comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Like where I immediately where my head goes in terms mm -hmm. of reaching out to them. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk about what when when your depression manifests itself. Uh, how how does it do so? Uh, my depression manifests itself in panic and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Give me some examples. Um, pan. Well, um, when I first when I when I, when it got really really bad was when I was eighteen. I just turned eighteen, and I was just finishing my um, freshman year of college, and I uh, had been smoking a lot of pot, and. Um, and I was smoking pot and I had a really, I had a, actually had a weird near death experience um, where I almost uh, went off the side of a cliff on a snowy mountain in Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. and, Always um, good when you're high mm -hmm, and paranoid. Yep. yep. And the best thing to do after that's happened is to go home and take a huge hit off a bong. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did. And I had this horrible experience where it felt like I was floating outside my body and I couldn't make words make sense and I couldn't move my mouth or my lips or my tongue. And I just wow. wanted... I just, I didn't understand what was happening to me. And I just, you know, tried to sleep it off. Right. And then a couple of days later, uh, I, because you're a stupid kid, I was like, eh, I'm sure that was a one-off. And I tried to smoke pot again. And this, cause I had smoked so much of it before that. Right. Um, and you were how old at this time? 18, just 18. turned 18. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then it happened again. And then I think I gave it like a week and then I tried to smoke pot again. That was the last time mm -hmm. three strikes. That yeah. same thing happened. So then I stopped. 
And then two nights later, after the last time I tried to smoke pot, I was just lying in my bed in my dorm room. And, um, and it happened to me without anything. I was sober, completely sober. Yeah. And it just came on like I was high. Yeah. So for the first, so that, and that lasted like 48 hours. This is not a panic attack in the conventional sense of the word where it was mm-hmm. like, oh, I didn't This feel sounds like, like a nervous breakdown. I didn't feel, oh yeah, it was a total, total yeah. breakdown. Um, I couldn't, I didn't. I didn't know what it was because I knew it wasn't a panic attack mm-hmm. because I, I, my understanding of a panic attack was your heart's racing. You feel like you can't breathe. You feel like you're going to pass mm-hmm. out. You want to go to the hospital. None of that was true for me. It felt more like, um, I it just felt like I was high. It just felt yeah. like it was really, really high in yes. a bad way. Yeah. And it didn't stop. I would go to sleep and wake up feeling the same way. Yeah. And by- so obviously this, this was uh, much more than just related to the, to smoking, yeah. smoking pot. This was yeah. something deeper, but possibly triggered by uh by by the pot smoking yeah and 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 had you ever taken any medication up up until this point no okay Mm -mm. um so did you did you go see somebody uh, i did i i you know i finished out the semester it was really hard um to finish out the semester i was totally overcommitted i'm sure that's a huge reason that this that that was happening to Mm -hmm. me that that happened i was taking photography classes so i was in the uh, dark room all the time I, i didn't have time to do that and do these two was doing two different plays and mm-hmm. i mean i just i just had totally you're trying to be everything myself. to everybody i was yeah and by the way everybody just called and they said that you are everything oh, so it actually worked it. it actually oh, worked it was totally yes. worth it yeah oh uh, <laughs> um so yeah i finished that semester out um barely and uh and went back home and got the only job i got my first job i'd never had a job before um and i got a job at a movie theater um and um, and I could barely hold that down because mm-hmm. I kept having these attacks, and so I started seeing so what a would psychiatrist. You do? What would you do if you were uh, in the middle of a work day? Would you say, "Excuse me," and then go to the bathroom? And well, the good th- you know the good thing about the movie theater was there were two pretty much two jobs that I had. I was either selling concessions, which was so fast paced that it distracted me and I didn't mm-hmm. have time to freak yeah. out. Or I was cleaning up after people in the dark movie theater. So if mm-hmm. I had a freak out, I could just like stand up against a wall in the darkness. And there's yeah. something that felt very safe about that. Mm-hmm. Um, where I would have my worst experiences, and I've learned this is true for a lot of people with, with anxiety disorders, would be at night in fluorescent lighting. Mm-hmm. So, um, for example, wow, if so I would specific. walk into, yeah, for, if, for example, if it were like dark at night and I would walk from being outside in the cool desert air to walking into like a target mm-hmm. and there was fluorescent light buzzing everywhere, mm-hmm. I would, that would trigger a panic attack instantly. Wow. And I, at the time I didn't, again, I didn't really know what to call it. I just was, I just would say I'm freaking out. You just thought it was Target's lack of selection. <laughs> it was Target. My God. That's never been true. This is Target the wrong, has always been well This stocked. is the wrong type of sale <laughs> for my particular neuroses. <laughs> Uh, but th- th- anyway, there's shrink. I, I feel like I don't want to drag on with all yeah. this too long, and I'll try to be extremely entertaining and charming through the whole thing. You've all too late. I'll put it into song. Already, I went to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> she was um, not a good fit for me. She w- she t- she characterized them as panic attacks, which was sort of like helpful because it was nice to have anyone tell me that mm-hmm. I wasn't going crazy. Yeah. Um, but her, she just was sort of. She was very clinical, and she was very. Um, she just didn't seem interested in doing anything except prescribing something. And I really balked at that. Mm -hmm. So I refused to take whatever it was. I think she wanted me to take an anti anxiety, I think not an antidepressant. And, um, and I just, uh, it was a real turnoff. So I only saw her a few times and then I stopped going. And then, um, when I went back up for my sophomore year of college, my room, I had two amazing roommates and thank God that I had them because, I wouldn't have got, I don't know how I would have gotten through. They were my two best friends, my friend Torin and my friend Jen. And, um, Torin, uh, is a guy and, um, it, he, uh, he, I don't know why I said that. I guess it's mm-hmm. an unusual name, but mm-hmm. anyway, he was, he was, um, studying social work. And so he was volunteering and working and studying with this, um, organization and he really loved his boss and she was also a counselor. She was mm-hmm. a private, you know, counselor. She wasn't, yeah. uh, she couldn't prescribe. But he said, you know, he had, he would see what I would go through day by day yeah. in my sophomore year. And and usually how the way it manifested um, when we started school up again was I would just wake up in the middle of the night, a la mm-hmm. a classic panic attack. I would literally wake up running from my bed. Like I would wake up mid-run. Wow. Um, heart racing, freaking out about 4 o'clock in the morning. And mm-hmm. then in order to go back to sleep, I sort of found mm-hmm. what my 
rhythm needed to be, which was I would listen to, it's embarrassing, I'd listen to James Taylor's Greatest Hits. I thought you were going to say Janice Ian, and I was going to say <laughs> Bad <laughs> Choice. Uh, I made a good choice. It was a good music section. I yeah. listened to James Taylor's Greatest Hits. Um, probably not surprisingly, I spent my childhood being sung Sweet Baby James by my dad to, yeah. to sleep when I was a kid. Yeah. You really reach out for those things that make you feel yeah. safe. Yeah. And I would make sleepy time tea. Thank you, Celestial Seasonings. Yeah. Uh, and and listen to James Taylor until I fell back you asleep know, again that, for a couple hours, and then I'd have to go to school. You know, that has been, for me, uh, one of the most important things in in finding, um, I, I don't know the way to describe, but finding contentment is doing little nice things for yourself. You know, it's taken me... 40 years, 50 years almost on this planet to realize that there's a good selfish and there's a bad selfish. Yeah. And for so much of my life, I was, wasn't was selfish when I should have been mm. and selfish when I shouldn't have been. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, my wife would say, that that person isn't even your friend. Why are you bending over backwards for them? You know, and it was probably because, you know, I wanted this, I wanted everybody to like me. And yeah. so I had no boundaries. And yet, then when you should, you know, you should be doing, uh, uh, shouldn't be an asshole. Then I would be an asshole because I wasn't getting enough, right. you know, for right. my, for myself. Um, and for those of you that have never had a panic attack, I, I only had one and it was shortly after the, the Northridge earthquake and I got high. My wife was on the road doing stand up. I had a couple of drinks and I got high and I was convinced that the next second another quake was yeah. absolutely going to hit. And even though intellectually I could understand another quake is not going to probably hit the chances of that, it's, it, it is such a sense of doom. Doom yeah. becomes such a reality yeah, that your body just then <clears throat> begins to, to react to it. Is that kind of what you were experiencing? Um, yeah, I mean, they're horrible. I wouldn't wish them on anyone. I yeah. would not wish them on my worst set. I don't have any, any enemies because I can't stand being disliked. But... Um, <laughs> But I would, I really wouldn't wish them on anyone. Yeah. I, 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 that would be such a specific form of torture. Like yeah. if somebody could just, I mean, if, if that would be mm -hmm. just getting in prison would cause me to have nonstop panic attacks, but that's really, right. and the whole idea of becoming, you know, there, nothing to fear, but fear itself. It really, it does feed itself. It's a hungry, hungry beast. It is. And, uh, and, it, and, and it's, it, it succeeds in that it, in itself is such a terrifying experience that you become afraid of the experience, which then mm -hmm. feeds the beast. Yes. So learning how to not give it that power. Yes. And that kind of goes back to what I was going to say, which I don't even think I got to about what my mom told me um, when I would reach out to her is she said, I know that this isn't a quick answer. It's not the answer you want right now because you just want to be told you're going to be fine in a month and you'll never have a problem with this again. But she said, one of the great things about getting older is that you just get to know yourself better and you get used to those feelings and they lose their power. And you, without sometimes without even trying, you just find yourself rationalizing experiences that are negative in a way that makes them discharged. Like, mm -hmm. like um, I don't even know if that's the right word, but, but just basically, ba I mean, in a nutshell, something like now, if I feel one coming on, mm -hmm. by and large, unless I'm really... Um, Unless I've been compromised in some way, like mm -hmm. if I were on drugs or if I were, but you don't you know, really do. You're pain. not much of a drinker no, or a drug no, doer. No, I'm not. Yeah. Um, I don't like that. That doesn't. It yeah. doesn't really soothe me. When was the last time you had a panic attack? Um, uh, not that long ago. I had a yeah. panic attack at the doctor's office because something I had something part of the procedure was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what I mean by compromised is that mm -hmm. once I was in a position where I was captive and I was in mm -hmm. pain, mm -hmm. um, my body immediately was like, Oh, freak out for so, sure. So it's safe to say that if you were kidnapped, that would probably trigger a panic <laughs> I'm attack. Sure it would. I'm Wouldn't that sure be it ironic? Would. That was the one place where you felt safe. <laughs> you had to be kidnapped from location to location. Kidnapped is a strong word. I think even if I got into a taxi and the driver seemed like he was going the wrong way, I might have a panic attack. <laughs> um, that's close enough to kidnapping. Yeah. But it, but I don't have, you know, I used to I used to love flying when I was a kid and, and even when I was a teenager and I started having problems flying it was never an mm -hmm. issue for me. And then, um, and then in my very, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, I couldn't fly for a while. I just couldn't get on a plane. And then when I could get on a plane, I would have panic attacks and I was taking Valium to try to not have panic attacks on planes. Mm -hmm. And that would just, that just kind of made me feel like 
still panicky, but sort of on the euphoric side of panic. It mm -hmm. wasn't. It didn't really calm me that much. Now, it just made me care less. Now, in between all these pa uh, panic attacks, where was there depression? Was there listlessness, well, not the, wanting to get out of bed? Yeah, I guess we're not kind of caring jumping. You... I guess we're kind of jumping all over the place. But yeah, yeah. I. But the the when I finally saw that counselor that Torn had recommended, her name yeah. was Diane. She um. I should have gotten to this sooner because my diagnosis was so specific, but mm. she was the first person I had ever spoken to in the two years, you know, that I'd really been suffering from this very specific set of symptoms mm -hmm. who said before I could even finish, like the first day I met her, she said, tell me what you're going through, what it's like. And I started describing it. And she said, I don't, you know, no disrespect. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? I'm going to stop you. Mm -hmm. After I had maybe said, I don't know. It's like I, I, because I told her about being right. high and that and yeah, how yeah. it started. She goes over and takes out that big old dictionary of mental illness definitions. Mm -hmm. And she flips open to a page and she doesn't say anything about what she, you know, what entry she's reading. She just starts asking me. She says, does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. um, patient has a you know something like patient has an alarming surreal sense of watching them him or herself from the outside um it almost feels she said does it almost feel like you have a really bad fever and i said yes and i said mm. yes about the tv thing i never would have known to put it that way but yes she said is does it get worse after you eat do you think sometimes it's because you're hungry and lightheaded mm -hmm. and you eat and it gets worse I said, yes, the tears are streaming down my really? face. I'm like, this is so specific. And I thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy because this oh other woman was God. like, oh, you're having panic attacks. And she just blanket, you know, right. defined it. And Diane said, I had this when I was your age. It's very rare, but I recognize what you're talking about because I had it. And she said it's called depersonalization displacement syndrome. Good Lord. And it's a part of anxiety and panic. But she said the parent disorder is depression. Yeah. And, it, and so often what ends up happening is um, in the sort of family tree of, of psychosomatic, I mean, mm. of, of psychotropic drugs and all that kind of stuff, mm. sh sh people get prescribed anti-anxiety drugs, which were, especially at the time where there were far fewer and they were way more addictive mm -hmm. and antidepressant was like, there was Prozac and that was it, right. it seemed like. Um, and she said, what happens a lot of the time is that young, young people have this, um, this kind of experience or this kind of problem, not necessarily as specific as mine, but even just panic and anxiety. And mm -hmm. they're prescribed that drug. And she said, what I found is that a better way down into it is mm -hmm. through treating the depression. Mm -hmm. And so she, um, treating the depression medically or treating through the therapy. depression, both. Yeah. She definitely wouldn't say just yeah. take a, a medication. And, and, I, I, and, and I have to say, I'm a big a believer in, in that. Yeah. Um, it, I, I believe that depression, uh, can manifest itself situationally and yeah. therapy is needed for that. But I also believe that the, the more insidious one is the physical manifestation of depression, which I have yet to find anything other than medication to work for because right. when it hits and it's really bad, it, you know, we've talked about this, you don't go to the bathroom sometimes, yeah. you know, for, for me, I, the, the last time it hit badly, I went off my meds and I, I wasn't, pooping for eight weeks i was having to get colonics and you know it's like it, it it's when when people look at somebody who has depression and thinks if they're just feeling self-pity they don't understand that physical depression is it, it's like somebody that has diabetes they lack insulin they they lack the chemicals in their brain and telling them to get over it is like or just yeah and or yeah and and saying i know you're strong enough to get up and go talk to someone about this and once you start talking you'll feel right. better right it's not that simple you can't that's the catch 22 horse. you can't you know you can the catch 22 whatever, is yeah. you you have such a negative view and you care so little about anything except the few things that bring you pleasure like you know playing a video game or right. overeating or something unhealthy that you don't help yourself because yeah. you're you're so cynical you think it's not going to work yeah you know and you yeah. get caught in this spiral and you and i have both had friends who have who've taken their lives Absolutely. because of uh of this absolutely um, so if you're if you're out there and you're and you're interested at all you think you might have depression you think somebody you know uh maybe has uh depression um you know uh take maybe take one of those surveys um go to the website we're going to try to put some information on the website so you can take surveys and we'll put some links on there for for people to uh to begin to ask themselves more questions about what uh what what it is that uh, counts as depression because i think it's i don't even know 
exactly. Yeah. And I, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but I know what it's like to be on a plane and people are flying nervously in turbulence and I'm thinking, please, God, go down. <laughs> please make the decision for me. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times. Uh, yeah. I've, I've almost never been afraid to fly because for so many years, I just, you know, it was such a war going on in my head, um, such negative feelings about myself and such physical depression um, that if I wasn't loaded or I wasn't yeah. collecting or doing something obsessively to, to take my mind off myself, I would be thinking about myself. And, uh, and that's always a bad dark alley to, right. uh, to go down. <laughs> but let's get, uh, let's get back to, um, uh, the meds. So you